Alrighty, this is, uh, <laughs> this was the publish, the Alias Wayfront, uh, magazine that was published. Mm. Has Alias Wayfront separate numbers, look at that, support, separate support numbers. Where's Alias? Well, Alias was in Canada, of course, and SGI was in California, so I'm, Assume those were that's what the difference is there. One's probably 416. What is that? That's where Alias was, and Wayfront was 805. These were the animation awards they were handing out, uh, graphics awards. There's mine down there, of course. Big deal. <laughs> little little animation that was done on Wavefront and all this other stuff is done by Alias, you know. Because uh, real artists can't use Wavefront. They could never figure it out. I was the only guy that could figure it out. Uh, if you ever looked at the amount of manuals that were required to learn Wavefront, it was it's like an Encyclopedia Britannica. The um, Wavefront... Um, one thing about Wavefront was that it was designed to be a scientific visualization package, not an animation package. It was only after Jurassic Park that Wavefront started trying to set them up, to set themselves up to be an animation package. They bought Kinemation. Kinemation was in Wavefront technology. They bought, they got somebody to do Kinemation or, or they bought it up from somebody else. And the kinemation was more of what I was using than Wavefront. Um, Wavefront is the guys that came up with the OBJ format. Um, I had mastered that whole package. Wavefront, TAV, uh, its own renderer and, uh, and modeler and all that stuff. And to do anything in Wavefront, it, it, it was not integrated. It was like each package you had... To, click into it had its own set of functions its own interface and you get out of that you're out of your modeler then you go into the renderer and it's got its own interface and it periodically crashed in fact it's it it uh it would it you had to uh you, there was a setting inside of wavefront to tell it when to uh, close the program down because it would systematically crash. And so I worked around that, worked around Wavefront TV. That was actually, my experiences with Wavefront TV were so much nicer than Power Animator. Power Animator would crash on you a lot, and they wouldn't say, you know. And this glowing effect in here in Power Animator, that's a post-production effect, post-production rendering effect. A lot of artists thought, wow, you know, Power Animator would do uh, would do uh, all these glowing effects, and they were really so taken by that. And while it, when I got access to it, I said, the glowing effect, it's not a volumetric. It's a two-dimensional post-production effect that's added on top of the render. You know, don't make me laugh, you know. It's like lens flare for, for Lightwave. And uh, in Wavefront, we had to do that stuff I had to do that stuff voluntarily. I had to take particle effects from Dynamation, load them up into uh, Composer, then put a blur on Composer, and then layer the blur on top of my particle effects. And that even then, it wasn't that convincing that the that the particles were glowing. The idea uh, Wavefront had to integrate all of their uh, graphics programs. Um, they said it was you could. You could use them all together. No, you couldn't. You had to render out all the images, and you could combine the images together inside of Composer, which is a post-production program. So that was their idea of integration. Blender, at the time uh, that I got access to it, was so much better than that. It had its own. Uh, it had its own. Um, I mean, it had its own video sequencer built in. You could use it to do the post-production. And uh, you could uh, you could include scenes as clips uh, whenever you were doing uh, when you were doing your um, rendering. It would uh, it would actually 
um, render out the scene as a clip and, and load it up and you could do post-production so you could um, and and uh, you could make the glow overs if you needed to do it in the 3d space using the particle all the particle effects in blender was just 2d planes um, normal uh, aligned with the camera you know with the track two constraint to the camera which is all um, particle effects Fancy particle effects are in any in any program. It's uh, going to be um, it's just going to be two D planes that are track two constraint to the camera. Um, yeah, but my animation was there, and that was what year was this? Ninety seven. It took them two years for to put my uh, animation, or, or took a year for them to put my animation in their little dinky. Um, quarterly uh, magazine that was supposed to make everybody feel good about the their investment in the latest wavefront technologies of course that really was not a very good um, publication um, you know this that was an interesting you know being able to use the interface with inside of our is power animator to control objects that's how they did the re rigging they would take uh, um, 3d objects with inside of um, power animator and use them to rig the characters and draw functions between the I'm bleeding um, This thing's on Composer. It looks like, yeah. Now look at Composer's screen. Look at this screen. Now what does that look like? You know, you see these strips right here? Like that, and they're nice multicolored strips. Look really closely at that. I'll just hold it still. If you're a Blender user, what does that look like to you? Looks like Video Sequence Editor. You know why? You know why? I'm not going to tell you why. But you know why? What kind of uh, 3D package did Tun try out before he um, got his idea for uh, making Blender? Oh, I'm sure he looked at Lightwave. He looked at I, he looked at Composer. I'm sure. I don't for, know for sure. I wasn't there. I know that he looked at some 3D software before he decided he was going to. He had a trial of some 3D software. You know, only him and whoever it was he got that trial from knows what he was using. And that's what influenced him. His copy of Blender was uh, commercial software. I think it was Composer. I think a lot of video sequencer uh, came out of Composer. And uh, so uh, Alias Power Animator, one of the reasons why I hated Alias was their fucked up inverse kinematic way of doing things. They didn't even bother to look at Kinemation. They just did their own thing and whenever they were uh, pushing, doing Maya. And Maya was mostly this sort of inverse kinematics. It was um, two, three, um, or one to two joint. Um, it was even less than that. It was You put your handle trying and start there and it ended there. It didn't go all that way. It went to the heel and then you had a handle chill going from the heel to the toe. And so all the blender guys ever knew to do was to do this kind of inverse kinematics. They didn't know anything about history-based inverse kinematics, which is what Kinemation used. The reason why history inverse kinematics is better than this uh, really weak uh, inverse kinematics is that... Um, um, Well, the thing is, is that with this, um, it's it's just a step up from being forward kinematics. Um, it's not even uh, 
really using inverse kinemax full throttle. It's not specifying uh, joint constraints on your knees. It's not specifying joint constraints on uh, any of the parts. And so um, you hold something in space, you move the, the, uh, the hip, and you push it down far enough, and the whole thing flings around and the knee flees around to the back end of the body where the um, it, so there's no joint constraints. You have to keep everything front facing and you have to have an up arrow con constraint uh, to keep your knees from, from flipping back. That's a weak inverse kinematics. A strong one would have joint constraints and would have a handle chain going all the way down to the toe, which is what I had with thorax was the ability to control, um, well, thorax was even pretty weak, I have to admit, because I was doing something like this, and I could have done thorax with this kind of uh, kinemation. But they, um, you could do, you could take a character, stick either handle chains and drop them down onto the ground, and watch the joints automatically compute, uh, get com the, the, computations to the joints uh, get the solvers for the joints work and uh, it would look realistic if you dropped a character on the ground um, if you had some sort of physics in animation you could drop a character on the ground and he would realistically splay on the ground after hitting it because the joint constraints and uh, the handle chains i'm sure maya does all that stuff it's just um, Aegis Power Anywhere didn't do it. And it disgusted me whenever I got to the IK in, in Aegis Power Anywhere. And I was just like, uh, this is what you guys have to offer me is, uh, is an up arrow constraint to, to prevent uh, the legs from going behind themselves and the knees to flipping over on the opposite end of the body, you know. Um, you had to be very careful with these, and just, you still, if you want to do that kind of IK with those old, uh, those old solvers, which is kind of what Blender does. It, Blender does this kind of solving. Um, you, it's it's I I don't like it. It's great for reusable reusability. But uh, I like I preferred and I would prefer to have back even in Blender um, um, history based IK. And here here's something about how to render reflection maps. Blender does this automatically. Um, I figured out where it is. It's in the material tabs. Um, you can use a material or or I think you have to turn on pano mode and it will auto render all the reflection maps. That's an old version of Blender will do that. And uh, yeah, it was the, that was the alias wavefront. This is the first Blender manual. This is uh, like a year after, I think this is a year, maybe three months after Ton started going full throttle into developing Blender and um, and uh, he had left Neo Geo. I don't think this has Neo Geo on it yet. It has published by Not a Number in 1998. Edenhoven, the Netherlands. That was where he was based. He didn't move to Amsterdam until uh, later, whenever he tried to turn Blender into a commercial uh enterprise with the angel investor and it wasn't it he wouldn't have ever gone to open source if it hadn't been for that investor because um the investor uh took back all of his source code and at least this is the story the story is is that um he lost access to the to the he lost licensing to the source code ownership of the source code and he had to negotiate with the angel investor um, some sort of solution to how to make Blender um, pay for itself or pay back the 
what the investor lost in the um you know in the enterprise that ton tried to start that didn't fly um and uh that's what opened the sources it was that and ton even after that didn't want to uh release the source i mean he he wanted to develop it wholeheartedly himself and he was not really he really wasn't ready to let anybody look at the source and he was very concerned about people's interpretation of the source he wanted to fully document it um i think that was what he was really do, trying to do is he wanted to get it all well documented so people because a lot of the comments in the source code were in dutch and nobody you know that he needed to have it all in english so he did that the, the funky funky uh, way of doing surfaces inside of blender uh using uh fractional uh, weights on your nerve surfaces usually whenever i get a nerve surface from blender i set the weights to one i don't even bother with these fractional weights to try to make things look smooth i i would just go ahead and try to model with a um and they weren't nerve surfaces anyhow they were i i'd call them herb surfaces they they weren't non-rational um uh, they weren't non-uniform rational b splines they were rational b splines um they missed he missed the non-uniform part the non-uniform part means that you should be able to cut the surface you should be able to cut the continuity of the surface somewhere along the way um, and that is um, to stop the um, interpolation of the surface to to break it like you were able to break a a a, a busier a, a busier uh, curve. Um, yeah, well, this is Blender. This is like Blender one point five, and he doesn't have an example of this on the site. He's got one point oh, but it only works in SGI, and he had some nice. Uh, the thing that w really impressed me about this was that this was an open source developer that had put this out. You know, this is, this is not, this is like, uh, usually if you get somebody who develops something in open source and they release a manual, it's usually a ring binder with, um, with paper inside of it. And it doesn't look professional like this. This thing did fall apart on the first day. I mean, it didn't take it very long for this thing to fall apart because it looks like it looks less like a manual and more like um, more like a um, something you send somebody to so they can get color swatches of what they're how you're going to paint their apartment. That's what it looks like is just a bunch of of uh, color swatches because some of these are this is a nice metallic tone to that. And I wonder where he got, where he got this stuff, you know. It looked like he, like he spent a lot of money into the production of the manual. And I was wondering how he was going to make his money back from the manual. Because this thing was so tight um, in quality. But, uh, and... And uh, oh, just to prove that it was to me. Uh, there you go, freedom and weep. And you can copy that as much as you want. You found found it here. Okay. It's like the only proof that I had any involvement with Ton, you know, for Kiernan with extra love. Okay. Yeah, the and yeah, it came out in '98, and that was when I adopted Blender. Um, I couldn't wait for this manual because I was so, I was so bothered. I I didn't really want to bug Ton anymore 
because I had to keep emailing him. And it was like I, he was taking time out of his development to write me these little page notes on how to work different parts of the program. And he needed a manual badly for this. And so when he put this out, it was like, oh, I just poured over these pages and tried to figure out how everything worked. I still couldn't understand it because it's still kind of Dutch, you know. It's got kind of a Dutch feel to it. But, um, but I figured it out from that. And I, if I want to reference it, we could cover it. You know, I could pull pages out of there and then go through on Blender and show you how to do various things um, in the old Blender. And the reason why I'm covering the old Blender in my tutorials now and not the new Blender is because I wanted people to see what Blender could do before it became popular, okay? And also to show probably the reason why people are so confused by Blender. But uh, I will beg to point out, if you think Blender is hard, just wait until you get Alias Power Animator. Just wait until you get Wavefront TV. You're never going to get it. You're going to get Maya. And Maya, um, they tried hard with Maya to make it easier for people to use by making it so that people could customize their interfaces to the program. The problem with that is whenever you try to do support on that, um, you can only default back to the original configuration of Maya. Because if they do any modification on their interface, it's like talking to that guy over the phone that says, oh, you know, no, I, I hit control, and then I, I did this, and then I messed around with this, and, the, and and I can't get this to work. And people say, I'm sorry, we can't help you. You just fucked everything up, you know. Um, that's, that's the deal. So, but with Blender, um, the interface did... Not until now, until 2.8, uh, has he even gotten to the point to where there, the interface is even going to be configurable. You know, 2.8, it's going to be configurable. We'll see what it does for the Blender usage. If it makes Blender easier, or if it makes it, if it, if it just, you know, screws it. Um, I will point out to, th to any th artist that's, planning to do 3D graphics. Whenever we held animation courses in college um, and we brought people in, um, two thirds of the class would leave after two weeks. That's how hard it is for people to do 3D graphics. That's just 3D graphics on the overall. It's not Blender. You know, just because you got access to Blender and said, oh, well, you know, Blender is so hard, I can't figure out. It's it's so difficult for me. Uh, you know, Maya's gonna, gotta be better. So then you go buy into Maya, and then you find out Maya's just as hard as Blender. I gotta, maybe we gotta go over to 3D Max. Maybe it's easier, you know. 3D graphics is fucking hard, man. It's not easy. And anybody who thinks it's, it could be easy maybe with Unity or something like that. Maybe if you had um, collections and libraries of put-together 3D content that you could place in VR, that's easier than this, but that doesn't mean it's better. Um, it's never going to be easy. It's always going to be hard to, to express yourself in 3D. But it'll be easier now with VR because everybody's got their own mocap and everybody's got their own camera. And, um, I mean, what is this little controller that I've got on my Go? It's only three off, but it's a full-on mocap. Um, I can aim my camera. I can wave, I can do puppeteering with this. You know, I can trigger, I can open the mouth up and down. I can do it this way if I want to. I could translate, I could say cut, 
as a director, I could find something to do with this. And if you got six off, that's even better. You could do all the all the things you need to do. You'd be a one armed actor. If you have two six offs, which uh, which the quest will have two six offs in it, and the headset they claim is going to have a six off. But uh, somebody said it's going to have six off. But if it's poorly lit in the room, it reverts back to three off. And so I'm like. So three points of six off if you're in your well lit room, you're a full fledged upper body actor. You are a puppeteer, and you've got your own mocap. You don't need anything more to do that. Um, maybe lip sync reading, uh, and my you probably noticing that on this video, uh, my lips motions are not matching up with the sound. That's the stupid friggin' camera. But it don't matter. Um, it don't, don't matter. Okay. So I will continue it on another video. I'll upload this to YouTube. And uh, so.